everyone, this is X O'Connor, and you are listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This week, we've got a great episode for you. We have Ginny Owens with us. She is a multiple dub award winning songwriter and artist known for a little song you probably know called If You Want Me To. And this is a cool show because this was actually recorded live at our most recent songwriting retreat. And I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I want to get you guys into this episode, but I just want to let you know, if you want to find out how to get involved with any of these secret events that we do, these cool, intimate, small setting events, please go over to fullcirclegoeslive.com. Join our mailing list. We'll throw out dates all the time. We're doing these every few months, so it's a great way to meet other writers such as yourselves. Great ways to interact with professional writers, build relationships. They're very cool events, and this was recorded live at our most recent one. So if you want to find out more about that, fullcirclegoeslive.com to register for that. And then also, if you want to just keep up with everything Full Circle Music, Head on over to Instagram, follow us at Official FC Music. And of course, if you're listening in iTunes, leave us a rating, leave us a review. We love hearing from you guys. But that's enough of my yakking. I want to get you guys into this episode because it's super inspiring. You're going to love it. Here we go, live from our songwriting retreat with Ginny Owens. I want to offer just based on my experience as a songwriter over the past billion years, I want to offer three key elements of a life of endless songwriting bliss. So three key elements to maintaining a songwriting life. So the first one is songwriting is a journey with a friend. Show up every day so that you can go a little further together. Songwriting is an art form. The more you know the rules and master the skill, the freer you will be to let your heart guide the process. And songwriting is a sought after treasure guarded by an enemy. In order to capture it, you must fight every day of your life. So I've been songwriting for, like I say, a few million years. And so what I'm gonna tell you is definitely from personal experience. And I promise to share some super embarrassing moments just so that you know it's for real. So let's start with the first one. Songwriting is a journey with a friend. Show up every day so that you can go a little further together. And because it's a journey, you have to start somewhere, right? And every day is a little bit about starting somewhere, but but you have to begin the journey somewhere. You guys are here and you are writing some lovely songs. I have heard them and been part of them. But let me just tell you a little bit about where I started. We had an out of tune piano with like a couple broken keys in my dining room that the church was gonna throw out. My parents took it. So I figured out at like age two that you can play a note on the piano and sing all your favorite songs like, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Mary had a little lamb. It all worked. And I was like, this thing's awesome. So <laughs> I, um, I decided that I should play the songs, you know, like learn more notes and play more notes on the piano. And so by the time I was five, I guess my mom sent me off to piano lessons and then I had to play like classical music. So the, the only bad thing was when I came home, so somebody else played this. I probably played it for six years at piano recitals. But when I came home and it was my time every day to practice, I would sit down and start Minuet and G and then I would end up just writing songs because that was more fun. So thanks to piano lessons, I became a songwriter. And the first song that I remember writing was when I was about seven and I was really inspired by Amy Grant music at the time. I I loved her early stuff, just how vulnerable she was and just this real honest, I mean, as a seven-year-old even, I couldn't put words to it, but I knew there was just something really heartfelt in the way that she shared. Songwriting, and I'm, I'm sure some of you guys can relate to this, songwriting became my way of journaling of sorts. I would just kind of sit at the piano and write about, you know, Jesus or boys or how my brother got on my nerves or boys or my friends at school or boys. Or at some point, like, all the songs were just about boys. And so... And I promise you that every time I sat down to write a song as a kid or a teenager or a young adult in college, I would always almost give up because I didn't think I could make it to the end. I just thought it was too hard to do. And I was afraid of failing. Like, what if the song wasn't good enough? 
what I have learned over the years is that there are many, you know, ups and downs to songwriting, many successes and failures. And by some miracle, I kept showing up. I wrote during college and I would play occasionally for different showcases and events. But right before my senior year, it was in my junior year, I was accompanying one of my friends in one of her lessons. And I had auditioned for a group on campus. And the professor of my friend, my friend's vocal teacher, she said to me, she's like, yeah, Jenny, I don't know. Your voice is just weak. I just, I don't know what's wrong with it, but I don't think that you're ever going to get very far with that idea. And so I thought, well, you know, she, she might be right. And at the very least, I don't need to finish a, a commercial music degree. So I finished my music ed degree, took something like 21 hours of science at, just to get out in four years. It was great. I wrote so many songs that semester. It was awesome. Wrote, wrote almost my entire first record during those like 21 hours of gen eds. But then I went on and, and did my student teaching and graduated with my music ed degree and desperately sought a job as a teacher. And what I found was people were really freaked out about the idea of hiring a visually impaired person to teach their students. And during that sort of dark season of looking for a job and someone had invited me to sing at church, which was kind of random. I never really got asked to sing at church. And so I sang a song I'd written and come to find out there was a, an audio engineer in the congregation who approached me a couple of weeks later and said, hey, have you ever thought of doing this for a living? And I said, well, yeah, but so does everybody else. So I'm going to teach instead. And so he said, well, you might be right. Like maybe you should teach, but why don't we at least try recording a few of your songs, just piano vocal demos. And so we did that. And he passed those around to his publisher friends in town and it felt like it took an eternity. So I kept, you know, interviewing for jobs and every now and then I'd hear from him and he'd say, nothing yet. I haven't heard anything new yet. So one day he finally called me and he said, there's a publisher in town that wants to meet with you. And a guy named Michael Perrier, who was over at a company called BMG Music at the time. And so since I was doing all this interviewing for teaching jobs, I said, well, maybe he, you know, maybe I should just like call him and get it over with and say, hey, guess what? I can't see if, if you don't want to meet. I totally understand. I did not end up doing that, but I did go meet with him. He ended up signing me. And then within a year, I was signed to a company called Rocket Town Records that was owned by Michael W. Smith. And I just, just so you know, I am definitely still learning. And I think what I finally learned is that you do have to take the journey a step at a time. You do have to show up. You do have to do the stuff every day, just like what you're doing this weekend. And as a result of doing that, you will always move forward. But you have to know that, you know, for every Mercy Me or Taylor Swift hit you write, you will have to write 100 bad soap or baby songs. I do believe, in, and this is probably my biggest struggle. We always hear it said, good is the enemy of great, but perfectionism is the enemy of creativity. So hear it from a perfectionist, you know, part of the way we get comfortable in our songwriting skin and the way that we grow like less critical, you know, in the negative ways and the way that we stop shutting down is to just keep taking the journey, keep showing up. I really like to think about it kind of like songwriting and faith are very similar journeys in that you can think of writing the way that you think of God as a very, very dear, dear friend. Obviously, God is much more than that. But writing for us is that very dear friend. And the more often you're with each other, the better and deeper your communication is going to be. But the less you see each other, even if it's a really good friend, there will be a divide to cross every time. You know, you'll have to relearn how to connect. So I encourage you to do it every day. And a couple of hacks on that front. Spend some time, I like to call it free writing. If you've ever read The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, she calls it morning pages. But spend like 10 minutes each day just spilling your thoughts onto the page. I think morning is the best time, but whenever, just take 10 minutes. You got 10 minutes, I promise. You have 10 minutes to do that. And just write whatever. If you can't think of what to write, write what you had for dinner last night or whatever it is that you want to write. I would also say schedule some weekly songwriting dates. Maybe you can only do two or one with yourself or with one of your buddies here that you've met this week. Did I just say buddy? One of your co-writers this week that you've met. Do a Skype write. 
but schedule those. Schedule one to two a week. That also, you know, we creative people don't like to schedule stuff, do we? But do that. The same with your instrument. Schedule some time with your instrument every week. So write it down, put it on your calendar. And because songwriting is a good friend that we're on a journey with, another key to understanding it is to unpacking the art of it, unpacking the art form. So the more you know the rules, the more you master the skills, you will be freer to let your heart guide the process. George Gershwin, you know, who used to write all the musicals and stuff, he said this really great quote. He said, many people say that too much study kills spontaneity in music, but all those study may kill a small talent. It is a must to develop a big one. Isn't that good? So in other words, know your stuff. And I'm gonna just give you a couple of super practical examples of what this means. I'm working on trying to write a book right now. And even though I write a lot, I don't write prose a lot. So I don't necessarily know all the rules. So it's really tough for me to get my thoughts out, like what's in my heart out, because I don't fully understand how to do it well. Does that make sense? So it's a little bit that way when you're writing a new style of music or when you're just even, you know, starting to write music, you guys have taken huge steps, obviously, by being here and Seth and Stacy and X and the crew, they have tons of awesome resources for you. And Google and YouTube have the rest of the resources that they don't have. You know, utilize those. Learn everything you can. If you play piano or guitar, even if you don't, start taking some lessons on YouTube. I mean, it's super easy and it's free. We like free. There are tons of videos on YouTube of writers talking about their process. Like there's some of... Like Max Martin, if you're into pop, Max Martin does a lot of, you know, sort of this very formulaic pop, which is awesome. And often amazingly sounds different, but he has videos that talk about how he does that. Taylor Swift, who I unfortunately will mention a lot just because I just always think she's a good pop standard to talk about. But check those out. Learn how people construct songs because there really is a science, you know, behind the art. Another thing I, I like to think about and recommend is listening, like two different types of listening that I call active and passive listening. So I really love pop music. So active listening for me is like when I work out in the mornings, just roll in the Apple, new Apple, like whatever pop playlist or what they're playing at Apple list or at Spotify, you know, playlist and learning. Like, you know, what are they doing in the songs that you're hearing that you like? How are they creating hooks? You know, what are the rhythm things sound like that they're doing? And so, you know, things like chain smokers came along and they sort of like created this chorus where you don't have to soar, you know, up in the top. You just do this like, baby, hold me closer in the backseat. I probably shouldn't be singing that at the Christian <laughs> not. So, but you know, like, it's just this tiny little space of a chorus. So there's just, there are trends that you start to see as you listen to music. If you're like a songwriter-ish type person, you know, like more of a, a James Taylor type person, then you can listen to current people like the do that, like James Bay or John Mayer hear what they're doing, sort of study their technique. But the other thing is passive listening. And what I guess I mean by that is falling in love with music. So one of the things I've recently discovered about myself is that I'm too busy like thinking about just analyzing songs and I actually need to go fall in love with music again because it's just too easy to be critical. And so what I've learned is probably the easiest way to do this, which is not something that's streaming really lends itself towards, but to go get people's albums and just listen to the full album and continue to immerse myself in it and be patient. Because I'm sure you, maybe some of you guys are like this too. I'm so impatient. I'll listen to half a song and then I flip to the next song. That does not like create and inspire love for music. I think those things are key for deepening our skill sets, growing our skill sets, educating ourselves. And then there's another aspect, just as we talk about kind of this skill of songwriting. It's really simple, but I think it's really important, especially for new writers. And I kind of call it the accessibility scale. So on one end, you have the more cerebral, the more personal kind of songs. Those are the songs you write for your grandma or your brother or a wedding. And then on the other end are the more super commercial songs. So like Bonnie Vare is super cerebral. Taylor, super commercial. Andrew Peterson, pretty cerebral. Tomlin, Jordan Felice, super commercial. 
And so the more cerebral a song is, the more it's kind of written to please the writer. So most of those things fall kind of more in the middle. You know, they're not generally purely one or the other. But the more cerebral form matters less, you know, it's kind of in the writer's head. And obviously the more commercial a song is, the more singable it is, the more melodic, the more many people can kind of follow what you're doing. You got to know the difference. If you want to write commercial, study it, learn the techniques, listen to the Full Circle podcast every week, because there's an art to expressing yourself that way. But if you're going to write about family, if you're going to write something super personal, don't let that out for critique, because you don't want to hurt yourself in that way. You know what I mean? Like you just protect the things that are really personal to you. And the more you kind of know the skill and the art of songwriting, the more you're going to know how to do that. You know what I mean? Does that make sense at all? All right, cool. So the last point, mastering the skill, taking the journey, ultimately helps with our biggest challenge as songwriters, which is fighting for your songwriting. (laughs) And if you don't believe me, I bet you do. Everybody probably believes that it's a fight. Songwriting is a treasure that's guarded by an enemy. And so in order to capture it, you must fight every day of your life. Not to be all dark and wage war-ish, but we got to wage some war. The hardest part of songwriting is what? Songwriting. (laughs) You know, you always got something else to do. Or there's always a voice in your head that says not to do it. And I promise, lest you think it only happens to new writers, I have this happen every day. I've just finally learned, oh, this is part of it. Like, this is what I'm gonna fight every day. And especially when you've been doing it a long time, you can kind of even get more in your head because you're like, what if I don't know how to do anything current? So if you give up, you, you know, then the enemy will win. So what exactly is the enemy? I do like how Kevin Pressfield, who wrote The Legend of Bagger Vance, but he has a book called The War of Art, which I would highly recommend you all read. There is some swearing, but read it anyway. But he calls the enemy resistance. And he says, any act that entails commitment of the heart is a reason for resistance. In other words, any act that rejects immediate gratification in favor of long-term growth, health, or integrity, or any act that derives from our higher nature instead of our lower will elicit resistance. Resistance cannot be seen, touched, heard, or smelled, but it can be felt. And the more important, get this, the more important a call or action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel toward pursuing it. Ouch. And resistance takes all different forms. Sometimes it's you, right? It's the lack of discipline. That's what it is for me a lot. I just want to do all the other fun things. And I want to think about songwriting. Really, I do, but maybe I'll get to it. That's why scheduling is so key. And there are voices in your head. And that's why scheduling and showing up every day is so key. It diminishes the voices, I promise you. Sometimes it's because you got to eat and so you got to work. You know, so that's also why finding that time every week and putting it on a calendar can be so awesome to do. Another key in fighting resistance is knowing the people who are in your space, knowing the people who are awesome and can hold you accountable, like probably some folks you've met here, and learning the people who are not safe for you to play music for. Another way to protect what you're writing. I have some dear family members that I learned finally, after years of not learning this, that I didn't need to play songs for them because they would say negative things, not meaning to. So, it is really, really good to to know who the safe people are and who the safe people are not when you're fighting resistance. Now, for those of us who are believers, who are people of faith, we know there is a deeper resistance from an enemy that is full on against you. And especially when it comes to pursuing a gift that God has given you to inspire others, And I really learned a lot about this about a year ago. I went through some really tangible resistance. I was on the road a lot, singing a lot. It was actually this time about two years ago. And I started to lose my voice. Like it was really painful to sing and I couldn't get out very many notes, which is not good. So I went to see a vocal coach and she said, oh, you may never sing the same way again and you're probably gonna have to have a shot in your vocal cords, which is an awesome thing to hear right before Christmas, right? 
So that was pretty frightening. I began to kind of train my voice. I didn't have the shot. I began to try to see if I could work it out. But a couple months later, still on the road, I found out I had a, like a massive abdominal tumor, which was pretty scary. And the doctors didn't know if that was cancer and they wouldn't know till they operated. And I was in the middle of a bunch of shows and I was like, well, now I need to have an operation, find out if I have cancer and then figure out how I'm going to eat and pay for the operation if I have to cancel all these shows. It was a really scary time. Talk about resistance. But God really got my attention and he taught me a lot about what was important. And lots of things burned away in that fire, I'm just going to tell you. And one of them was, I realized that music, it was not just a gift, and it wasn't the gift that defines me. I mean, God's love is what is placed in each of us. That is what defines us. But that that it was key to remember to use my gift to honor Him and to stay focused on that mission of helping to bring light by using the gift that he had given me. And so the biggest thing that I learned to do in the fire of resistance was to pray. And like Paul says in Philippians, to thank him, to bring our requests and thank him because we know that he is on our side in the resistance and he's fighting the enemy with us, the enemy that loves resistance. He is fighting with us. So just to close, I'll just say as encouragement to you guys, God has placed this gift inside of you. So take the journey with your friends, learn everything you can and treat it like the treasure that it is and fight for it and know that you're not alone in your fight. So thank y'all. Hey everyone, this is X O'Connor and you've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This show is produced by the Full Circle Music Company with editing help from Jordan Salamone. Tune in next week. We've got another great episode coming from you. It's a group of guys. I don't want to give too much away, but they're incredibly talented artists with an incredibly talented story. You guys are not going to want to miss out on it. And again, if you want to learn more about our events from which this was recorded, head on over to fullcirclegoeslive.com to find out more. And of course, to keep up with all things Full Circle Music, follow us on Instagram at officialfcmusic. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll look forward to seeing you all next week.